Office of the Chancellor's so, live uh, stream. We are uh, reconvening the, the uh, work group on the student success fee. And uh, if we could see, please, uh, the lines that are in red up at the top. I think there's a few more things to add in what is now numbered seven, just for the sake of uh, identif identification. Um, we need to put in here a sentence that uh, indicates uh, that any campus contemplating a new fee or increasing an existing fee needs to sit down with the chancellor and explain the process and have approval for the process so we can get the words right, but that thought needs to be put in Absolutely. either here or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's an a priori consultation and approval, formal approval of process. So that'd be a second set of eyes looking at does the process comport to policy. The next thing would be, yeah. Contemplating a net new addition to an existing fee not already scheduled. An existing fee not already scheduled, yep. Again, to remove any ambiguity. Yeah. We'll consult with the chancellor and, and receive approval on process. And must receive approval on process before proceeding. Again, just to make it pedantic, I guess. Process. So then the second thing that was, uh, you know, necessary is to put in, so if the vote is thumbs down and it's December 15th, can you come back and try again in March or you get one, one, one academic, you know, every academic year you get a shot at this. I mean, what's the, what's the frequency? I mean, what we don't want to do is, is set up a system where uh, students feel badgered, if you will, for want of a better word. But also we don't want to set up a system that paralyzes a campus for an inappropriate amount of time because it could have been that it allows a job in the consultation mm -hmm. and when people realize what it was really when they want to get moving. So what's the frequency? I, I, I would propose one calendar year. I agree. How about academic year? We work in academic years. Well, the, the yeah, the one academic year. You're saying uh, if it's in September through June. September through June. Yeah. So the next September through June. Right. So, okay. Is uh, is is that the the term academic year is specifically known by all? There's no by all at the beginning yeah. of the fall term and the end of the spring or winter term and, thing. And the difference is, say it in February of 2017, you might start the process again in November of, of that same year, mm -hmm. but it's a different academic year. Mm -hmm. In reality, that won't happen unless it was really close and people said it's probably in all intents and purposes going to be two or three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it really failed badly, because you don't all, come back. It's, it's, it's also a, uh, it's going to cost a few dollars on the campus to yes. put this on and the Energy. hassle and everything. No, they, they want to go through this, so oh, it's like time away. Mm -hmm. so, so, so some yeah. place in here, Lars, just say that that success fees or or they're uns once per once per academic year. And that, <laughs> so you can figure out the wording. Now, so yeah. well, actually, make sure. Awesome. I would also make sure, Chancellor, that it's really clear if you're going to come back, you got to come back to the Chancellor again and get it approved. Right. I mean, you don't. Right. You you. Okay. You don't have one fail. Thank you. You, you got to go back to the chancellor and discuss your process again. Start it from scratch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, that that might be that might be very helpful and prevent you from failing again if you talk to some people. Right. Right. So, uh, what about what if it's a different type of success fee? Can you come back with? I mean, are there different types? I would argue it should be one per year. Right? You know, I think I think most of us will, you, you would think through very carefully before you go through this process. It's mm -hmm. labor intensive for students, especially when you have the students giving these presentations for side. 
engaging mm -hmm. the Senate, all of that takes a lot of time. So I would say for any student success fee, one. And if you want another, a different one the next year, you still have to go to the chance and say we're changing. Well, let me just say, if you're limited, each campus is limited to one proposed success fee per academic year. You agree with me, Jeff, on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I just to say success fee, uh, success fee proposals may be brought before the student body once per academic year. No, no, no more frequently than. <laughs> That's the floor. That's not the. Yeah. Okay. So now I've gone through um, Trustee Fagan's original document, and there are some other sentences in here that I'd like to pull up and put next because I think they are a, a d developments and iterations of um, and refinements of the thoughts we've already got in red. So Lars, if you would just bear with me, we'll do this and then we'll let everybody debate as whether why. So if you go now down to line, uh, let's see, where would it be? Um, in, in your black part there, line four, beginning with the word, if the proposed fees, mm -hmm. from there through the word chancellor at the end of that line, nope, back up just three lines. That is the, then the next paragraph that goes up. I'd start a new paragraph there. Oh, turn green, that's fine. And then I'll go back down to the black. Uh, down to uh, right about where that cursor is, go up two lines right there, that, starting with that, the. Mm -hmm. And I would go from there to the end and pull that up as the next green paragraph. And then I would change this, the, I would go to the committee further recommends, take out also, that each campus be required to have online a transparent, accountability protocol that clarifies mm -hmm. and then delete, just keep deleting across until you get to how, oh, right there, clarifies how fees are spent and how decisions are made on what the fee shall be spent for period. I would delete the some campuses sentence. Yep, right there. And then in the next sentence, I would turn the that standard to this standard. Okay, so now if you could go back up, Lars, and go back down so we can see the green. Okay, so we had the frequency in per academic year, and then more clarification on and we still have to come back and discuss board versus chancellor in a second. But I think that captures all of the sequence that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. Check with the chancellor on process, do it once per year, transparent accountability protocol, and student voices are driving the decisions here. And one question I'd like to work group to consider is, do we want to say include significant student representation, preferably a majority or just say majority, majority. and uh, take any ambiguity out? So Jeff, you had your hand up? That was it. Great. I just had a question for the work group. Um, in terms of, I know now we put a parameter in terms of how much, uh, how often a proposal can be addressed, but have, do we have any parameters in terms of how um, long a process should take or a minimum of how long a process should take at this point? I think the fact that you have to get a, a voting majority mm -hmm. will That's dictate the process. And some places that are small and, you know, maritime, they could probably drive something through, you know, to vote and mm -hmm. yeah. get that. Yeah. Okay. Whereas a big place with a lot of commuting students, it may take you six months, right? Mm -hmm. I do want to go back to that last point. Are we going to say preferably a majority of students or require a majority of students? 
I think it would be stronger if we required it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but um, yeah. I also want to make it practical. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, there's an accountability that students demand of us mm -hmm. appropriately. But also, at the end of the day, there has to be professional staff who know the rules about this stuff and have to be part of the decision, too. And when it goes bad, it's one person's rear end that's on the line, and that's the president. So it can't be a student committee that decides and tells the president. But I think there is a recommendation process, and most presidents would uh, follow that recommendation unless they find and then if they didn't, if they couldn't follow it, they'd send it back until they could follow it, right? Mm -hmm. but, but let's get the right words here I so it's not ambiguous. Sure we're, we're talking about number, whatever, what number nine is, the simple majority of the students voting, is that what you're talking about? No, it's so, down at the end of the green, uh, uh, on paragraph 11 there. Right. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the, uh, the, the, the body that either recommends to the president mm -hmm. or makes the decision on how the money is spent. Mm -hmm whether it should be recommending a significant okay. number of students or a majority of students. And how is there so much to include significant student representation? That's not in here. It's over, you're over 50% yeah. on the committee. Well, yeah, I think it's and significant. I mean, I could make a case if I was a, a uh, contrarian saying, well, I had 10% students in there, right? So we, we, you could get a quibble as to what's significant rather than shall include a majority student representation okay. in the majority. And just, mm -hmm. fine, so That's it's 50% plus it. one. So if it's a committee of 10, there's six students. Mm -hmm. uh, committee of nine, there's five students, right? Mm -hmm. And four mm -hmm. administrators. Mm -hmm. Or faculty. Or faculty, mm -hmm. or staff, or community advisors, or whatever. Okay. Oops. Got it. I hope you're hitting save every possible moment here, Lars. That would be not make anybody's day. So I think the final point then to discuss is uh, down now in the black, if invisible, <laughs> margin. So I think we can cross out low turnout as a concern because mm -hmm. um, we've covered all of that, I believe. And we'll get a clean look at this in a minute. Okay, so down through binding, that can go. Here's then the next point uh, where I'm sure there's a range of views. Um, if they are to be used for expenditures that include faculty and advisor hiring and support, then it should be taken to the vote of the full board of trustees. So on one hand, I understand that. Um, on the other hand, it does create something that President Armstrong alluded to, and I'm going to ask him to reiterate it. But the final thing I would say is just about everything that the fees include, whether it's IT, library hours, um, advising, mentoring, veterans, uh, let alone classes, require faculty or staff to execute. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what the real number would be, but I would say if there was a $100 raised by a student success fee, 98 of those dollars are going to be personnel costs. Right. So, so if we were to take what's in black as it's currently stated and literally, then everything goes to the Board of Trustees for approval because it's all personnel costs. Yeah. Well, that's not the goal, no. right. obviously. Uh, so, the, but you, Jeff, do you want to? Yeah, Jeff, could you weigh in on, on what will, the, di di the dynamic that will happen here that's, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm really concerned that you you set up uh, a train wreck where a group of students and a given campus uh, and and again let me preface it by saying if you look I've I've been at several universities the vast majority of our budgets are tied up in people right and so it's it's it, granted that there's things that are gray and some things that are traditionally covered by tuition um, with the differences we have with our campuses uh, we we would probably we wouldn't have a student success fee if it hadn't if it didn't include faculty but the practical matter that I see is a is a, a vote on a campus and 55 60 65 percent in favor and then it goes to the board and it gets caught up in a much bigger scenario than the individual campus 
And we said, as we've said today, the student voice is important, but then we basically said, well, no, not in this case. So it, it, it's really difficult um, and really hampers flexibility. And I don't, I don't think that's what you intend, but I, I, I'd like to learn more. Well, I, I think sort of getting back to that, the question is who decides tuition? And part of what the discussion here is we're getting into is what's the definition of tuition? And so, um, you know, it's hard for me to believe you can't all know. I mean, I, I know there's ways to parse this thing so that everything is tuition, but we all know that's not true. We all know we want to hire new faculty and we can do that if we increase tuition. Okay. Um, what you've done, but you've done it on an individual campus basis. And so, you know, to say tuition is, re, you know, the tuition is, I think, getting away from the, from the point. But, but the, what we're saying about, about this is it's an on-campus decision and the students are going to vote, but we're going to restrict it to a really small number of things that don't allow or the differences among the campuses. For us hiring faculty, it isn't about replacing tuition. It's the fact that our our faculty and programs are more expensive than what tuition would ever provide. You know, Jeff, I don't have the slightest argument with you over the need to have more faculty. And one of the things we have in this resolution is an acknowledgement about the good hearted, real caring uh, purpose behind all this. So that's, that's not it. The two issues on tuition are really when it comes down to tuition, I think the, the structure of the CSU is generally that the Board of Trustees makes a decision about tuition. And we've always done that. Now, tuition on a system-wide basis. So what this really comes out to be is the question, I guess, you know, is can campuses increase their own tuition uh, without the board being involved? And this thing is, is this issue about the understanding of getting all that money from the state with an understanding that we're going to freeze tuition, and we all know the public view of uh, tuition and what has happened in the but, past. But the, one, one other point that what you've said I don't, I think has fallen through the cracks and gets to where you said this wasn't one size fits all. I think it is because you're calling faculty as a faculty as a faculty and a campus is a campus is a campus. Have different circumstances. On one campus, they need advising. On another campus, they want to do athletics. On our campus, they wanted to hire faculty. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to make the decision with their money. They voted. And we're really taking that away from the students. We're, we're saying, let the students decide, and then we're taking it away. Except uh, the success fee structure up to this point has always been, uh, even when the students uh, vote, that the president and then the chancellor approve it. So mm -hmm. you're, you're not the case that we've said where the students decide has always been the case. It's not even that now. And we're not doing that in this case. Only, only in the situation of a, what is perceived as a tuition increase. So I think I have a solution, but I'd like to have President Deal on that first. Well, it also includes, if I, I think the state is giving us a certain amount of dollars which, if I remember the chart that Dr. Vogel gave us, has really not accommodated the increase, tremendous increase of students that we are serving. So on the one hand, we're being told, get the students out quickly. They want them out as fast as possible. On the other hand, we don't have the faculty, nor, and it says advisors, nor the advisors, being able to serve a very different student body and also a much higher percentage of individuals. And so we, I don't see this as a tuition increase per se. I see it as a supplement to serve the increase of students that we have taken on without the scholars and support. So, so let me try a, a thought to test the group with a reframe of this piece of our discussion. I'm going to use three 
And I always have to stop for the their metaphors or similes because I was taken to task recently by the network board for saying something was a metaphor when in fact it was a So there are comparators. So one comparator is in the world of philanthropy where uh, it is common for a public university to make the case to donors that look, the state of X supports the basic infrastructure of my campus, my system. But for us to have these points of excellence, these spires of, of great achievement that make sense regionally, locally, nationally, requires private philanthropy. So that's a plus up. So the base, so the state provides a basal support for opening the doors and, 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 and moving forward. But these philanthropic dollars allow spires of excellence. In some respects, the fee here is like a philanthropic gift. The second similarity I would point to are in community colleges where there is a certain level of funding, but then local districts can tax themselves because of their high cost programs or the need for more uh, aerospace engineer technicians or um, out in Coachella, the wind, engine, wind turbine technicians who climb up those big turbines, et cetera. So again, local need, local decision, local funding. And so I don't see the student success fee being a tuition as the basal tuition that the trustee sets in the context in which the Board of Trustees makes its policy decisions. But I see it as a local control decision to create an enhancement that is an enhancement either of the point of excellence, for example, with a high cost architecture program or a a world-renowned marine science program that needs that level of person to really be something that helps California succeed. Or it could be a student success fee based on, and I'll pick one of our campuses in the Inland Empire, where there's a very high proportion of first-generation poor students who need a whole bunch of the developmental courses in mathematics and writing. There's a cost associated with that. Very much analogous in that latter example Governor Brown's proposal in the, uh, in action actually, in the uh, public schools where there's a distribution of a certain baseline to everybody, and then some in the very high need, high expense uh, uh, school districts, some supplemental dollars to deal with the specific needs of that particular, usually inner city or rural or frontier neighborhood where the basal support doesn't provide, doesn't provide enough support. I guess the final thing I would say is I view this as a um, really serving our students. And in some cases, it's students who have this enormous need, and we saw veterans, and we saw people with disability, we saw people who come out of poor K through 12 who need help in some of those early developmental skills. In other cases, it's needs based on students who've come out of out of opportunity, if not privilege. Who were at that level who were going to go in and start in six or six and a half year jobs in, in some very uh, demanding fields. In all cases, I would say that this is a resource that allows local control to decide what their most highly competing needs are, engage the students, and if they're willing to tax themselves, not be imposed by the trustees or by anybody else, but to tax themselves for that activity, then that should be the student the decision and the oversight comes from the president and from myself, not whether the student's voice was was heard or not, but whether the process that led to that voice, the things that they want to support are within policy. The oversight for me as chancellor would never be, well, I disagree that this is worthy. Even though you all want it, I don't think it's worthy. If it's within policy, then I would be one to support it. And that's how I've been about reviewing the cases that have come to me in my short time here through Fullerton, Dominguez Hills, and San Diego, and perhaps one other. So I don't know if that, those parallels help I, reframe our discussion, but I want to put that out there. Can I just uh, accentuate what, what the chancellor said? I guess another way that I look at it is the, the board has the broad response 
responsibility for the system-wide tuition that impacts all campuses. I think it's nearly impossible for the board to dive down and know the details of what's needed at Northridge, what's needed at Dominguez Hills, what's needed at San Luis Obispo, and that's where the student voice comes in. And to, li and to, to limit the personnel side, which is really what this would do, you're basically taking eighty percent of of the the local control away, and it it really it really guts. It, it creates a paradox because on one hand we say we want the students to to vote, and they know what's going on on that campus. So the the paradox is clear. I mean, it's uh, you know you get these things throughout the world, uh, democratizing a country that. Uh, then votes in an anti-democratic uh, regime is a, a you know there's paradoxes in, the, in these situations all the time uh i'm mixed on this i must tell you and in, in that you know being able to more classes and have more advisors is a good thing that's what i've been saying there's no doubt about that uh, the question is more structured process I've got an idea. What if we put this in place and leave local control, but say the board needs to reevaluate this in five years? Because things could change. Because right now, I mean, I, I come back and say, I, I would use the Inland Empire, em, Empire question, or I would use ours as an example, two different needs that are very locally different. Why limit the ability of that local population to make a decision that's going to make life better for them? Because I have real question about the board ever passing. I, I really think it'd be almost impossible. Well, I'm not. I, mean, I don't know that that's the case. I mean, and and the reason is um, that you know if the students have, have passed it, the president has passed it, the chancellor's passed it, and it has to get all that way up, then I think. The board would be, uh, you know, highly likely to go along with that. But the reason for the board's involvement only in these situations is the idea that uh, these kinds of issues are at the very basic part of what the board does, its policy. But I think it also gets to the, the, the only one vote against both resolutions on our Cal Poly campus uh, was a faculty member. And uh, the faculty member said, I'm voting against this because the state should be Providing it. And I could agree with everything you're saying, and I would say, let's do it, but I don't see the state in the immediate future providing the support for the new majority, the Inland Empire, or the specialized, and, it, and whether we parse it out. It's that added, those spires of excellence. Uh, and really, it's completion. So that's the, that's the problem. Right. That's where the reality comes. What if we um, put in our recommendation? forward here one is we could uh, put in our recommendation an annual reporting to the board just like i have uh, been tasked to, has been tasked to report uh, any vice presidential salary increases on an annual basis and things of that nature so it gets a light shone on it a little and in front of the board on an annual basis and so if if it becomes apparent to the board that there is a, a problem or abuse or whatever it doesn't go on for years sort of under the ground. That may be one solution. I think the board makes decisions on policy um, and there's a circadian rhythm of timing, for example. So if we were to be approving, um, the board was having to approve a fee increase. At the same time, there was, let's say, a, an overall tuition increase on, chances are that the optics would be such that the board would say, um, you know, we ought not to be doing all this stuff at one time. So there's going to be sort of circadian rhythm of good judgment as to when you make controversial decisions or important decisions based on other things out there in the statewide context. So all of a sudden, by board level, we've allowed that milieu to be influencing uh, management decisions and student decisions in a way are not necessarily related to the specific success we at hand. So that's one way to go forward is to put in um, annual reporting to the board. 
Another way to go forward would be, I, maybe I'm the only outlier here, but um, is if this work group can't come to consensus on this one point, is we say we came to consensus on these recommendations, and here's one where there's a range of views, and we'd like to express those range of views to the larger board of trustees, and have a uh, you know have a, 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 a robust discussion at that level, and then from there decide what to take. So we don't preempt the board to weigh in on something where there may also be a range of views. I, I think that would be totally reasonable. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to vote on it. We just say. A range of views, and uh, I, mean, I think we have, I think we have unanimity on everything else. I do too, and yeah. maybe not on this one sentence. Right. And yeah. So we just bring the one sentence forward and lay out the arguments on both yeah. sides, and then have a discussion. Yeah, I, I also uh, I'm kind of interested when I think about it, but your idea of at least four annual reports might uh, might be able to nibble at that yeah. in that direction. So. Yeah. Well, I I think there's there's real change here too. I don't think. Uh, First oh, huge change. <laughs> it's huge. Change. It's huge change, and and a lot of our colleagues are are going to gulp. Uh, there will be a lot of discussion about about. I'll well, so, tell them to talk to you. You're, you're they will. partly responsible. So <laughs> you're, you're the guy. <laughs> you're the lawyer. Cancer. Cancer. <laughs> hey, cancer. There yes. is a uh, annual report on student fees typically at the November meeting, which in includes student success fees. Um, it's usually a reporting out uh, done by staff. And we actually had this discussion when in the spring, when does that report take place? And what happens is that isn't often a robust discussion by the board. Um, I think that it's been a, and Rodney, you've made the presentation I know last year and the year before that when I've been here, and, and that, that's something to consider that this is already reported. It's just the manner in which the board is engaged in it because you'll, you'll see it this year. Uh, it actually comes just after uh, this item is brought up at the board. The one, the one downside on the annual reporting and, and as the chancellor describes the report on this specific issue could be made more robust and hone in on that kinds of concern is it's the the horses out of the barn by that point and uh you know it, it may be something that the board says oh how, how could we have done that but it's a done deal especially when we're talking about hiring faculty once you hire faculty they're locked in right. you know unless they're hired uh, and they're actually on a temporary basis but i don't think that's what we're talking about is it oh, no. No. Yeah. yeah so but, uh, you know, so we can, you know, so a robust presentation would be not only what the numbers are, but here are seven examples of impact. Mm -hmm. and how does it drive or not drive? Excuse me, Chen. I, sure. I'm not terribly fond of it. It's, it's a bit Orwellian and not necessarily in some people's minds. We heard this from some of the students connected to their success. And so I, you know, just an aside, not something for the big uh, re recommendation, but as an aside, I personally prefer to see something a little less, uh, uh, a little different name, but. Um, and not every campus. Do you have an idea like opportunity? Not every campus labels it a student success fee. Yeah, there's a quality fee at the North Ridge. Campus quality fee, access to excellence fee at East Bay. So there's a few distinctions based on what they allocate their fees to. But that's true. A lot of discussions that came up was what does it mean for success? I, I was thinking of something a little less neutral. I mean, a little more neutral. Mm -hmm. You know, fourteen uh, B. Yeah. <laughs> Category two. <laughs> and just and well, just that. Just to add why you're considering that one sentence, these fees are typically deposited in an operating fund. All, all revenue in the operating fund is considered for tuition, what we're considering in the sentence, tuition purposes, because they're either funded by the uh, system by tuition fee revenue or by the state general fund appropriation. So that's one thing. And the second thing is Sorry, that these- Sorry, why don't you explain exactly what you just said? Oh, uh, in, in in this one sentence where you're saying that the board would approve any of these fees that cover tuition, the majority of these fees are all deposited in an operating fund. An operating fund 
is the tuition fund, meaning it's covered, it covers uh, activities that are funded by either student system wide fee tuition or by the state general fund appropriation. And that's where most of these fees are deposited. So if you use that sentence, then anything that these, any of these fees would probably be, uh, would be technically considered tuition just from the accounting standpoint or the financial standpoint. The second thing is that uh, the majority of these fees split their activities as Talara was saying, some, and others have said, some covers athletics, some covers these operating fund activities. You'd have to literally go in then and split the fee and bring a portion of the fee to the board if you were gonna identify just those things are technically considered operating fund or tuition type activities. Complicated. That's uh, idea. Instead of a direct approval by the board, what if, the, what if there was nullification by the board for cause? Say that again. What? What if there was nullification by the board instead of approval by the board? It goes through and for cause, there's there's reasons that the board feels that these this fee should not be there. That the board would be able to nullify it rather than approve it. I think the board can nullify anything they want. Yeah, yeah but right. that's uh, yeah. what we can do is have like a sixty day period, and if there's no null then it automatically takes effect and notify the board pri you know, in time so that if anybody wants to bring up something like that. The, but it doesn't address kind of what this is the, the biggest problem, and that is what is tuition. And here we're getting into definitions, and, and I, I, you know, it's sort of like, come on, we all know really what we're talking about when I talk about tuition. And and it's a complex thing, and it, it covers other definitions, but what we're really looking at, and, you know, are, are, are doing things on a campus basis that would be, if it were system-wide, considered something that without doubt the board would have to approve and nobody else. But, but I, I, I don't, I, I view it as there is a, there's a base support from the Mm -hmm. And then there's campus local control and to, I really believe, arbitrarily set faculty separate from anything else because, again, 20 years ago, the state covered everything and a, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. It, and there was, and on most campuses, tuition covers everything. So it really isn't to me about what's tuition. It's about are we going to allow the campuses to deal with their unique circumstances. It's not about everybody needing faculty, it's about individual circumstances. So a question would be, give me a scenario where the board would say no after the majority of students have voted. I mean, we went through this whole process. Why Why would the board say yeah. no? I, I can't speak for this board or any future imaginary <laughs> boards, but uh, you know, the real issue is those two issues that were uh, brought up is is uh, uh, is this a tuition increase or is not? And that's a, you know, to, to most people that seems like a simple question. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, the idea of saying, okay, this one issue was brought up, and here's the concerns on one side, here's the concerns on the other side. What do you think? And just bring it to the board in that manner, including the idea of the annual robust report. Uh, and maybe the nullification idea and have that range out there as part of the discussion. It's an information item. Right. And, uh, you know, I think we've done pretty well up to this point, and I think we've done well on this point. So Fair open yeah. it up to the board and see what we can do. We'll hear that discussion. We can have another work group meeting after the board meeting, but before January's board meeting to take the conversation, put it in words. Maybe then would be the time to transfer it onto the and 54 right. rather than yeah. at three, 320. I would say right. uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so let me see if I have uh, 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 captured where we are. So I'll try to just in the least number of words possible. I just want to, one point of clarification here. As we talk about the board presentation, one thing to consider is that we now that board presentation has often been a rear view mirror of where of what fees are in place. But now, if you go back a few paragraphs, 
the chancellor is now being informed on upcoming fees. And so if the chancellor were informed on upcoming fees in that November board meeting or whenever that board meeting were to take place, the chancellor could present then to the board, this is the new campus XYZ fee that's being proposed and this is the type of consultation. And that would allow then for public comment if a campus were then to want to come to the trustees and say, so it's just an opportunity then for the board to hear what's coming. And that's just something to remember, you've made that change, so it wouldn't be the same every year. So it's both a pro prospective as well as a retrospective analysis on this particular component of that fee report, which has $3 for this and $5 for that. And so I, I think what we've done today is had an, an honest conversation about the charge that was given to us by Chair Monville and also by the legislators. Trustee Fagan has facilitated the process by creating a draft document that provided a substrate for um, robust discussion of uh, at, a, at a high level in most cases and down in the details when necessary that I think the work group has debated and edited and has been captured, um, uh, not yet finalized in terms of um, format, et cetera. There seems to me to be unanimity in everything we discussed, except for this last to topic, which I would suggest we also have unanimity on bringing in front of the board with a presentation of what the issue is and the perspectives that speak to, to various aspects of that and then engage the board in a discussion, not only of this one issue, but all of the other issues that we discussed here today. And I think there'd be unanimous support to do that. And then finally, we would schedule another work group meeting after the next, after the November board of trustees meeting and before the January one, that would be a publicly noticed meeting to go from that discussion with the board to a final uh, set of action recommendations in the January meeting. I think that's where we are. And I would hold out that there may be an editorial word change, a grammatical thing to be cleaned up, but we would be very clear about all of that going forward. No change in the substance or spirit of the discussion of the work group going forward. Uh, does anyone care to comment on that? And otherwise, maybe we could take a vote. All those who feel that that is an accurate path forward and an accurate representation of our uh, deliberations today, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The public meeting of the uh, CSU work group on uh, student testing is now closed. Thank you everybody for participating. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly. This is the California State University Office of the Chancellor's live stream. Please adjust your audio accordingly.